Imagine standing on a world where the atmosphere is a corrosive soup of sulfuric acid, the temperature is hot enough to melt lead, and the pressure feels like the weight of a hundred elephants pressing down on every inch of your body. This is Venus, a place so hostile to life, it makes the cold, barren plains of Mars look inviting. And yet for more than two decades, the Soviet Union became obsessed with this fiery inferno. Between 1961 and 1984, the USSR launched over two dozen missions to Venus. Most failed, some barely left Earth. Others were lost in space, but each failure only fueled their determination. While the United States chased the moon and Mars, the Soviets had their sights set on something more enigmatic, more hellish, and perhaps more revealing Venus. So what did they find? Was it merely a barren wasteland or something more, something that could reshape our understanding of life, planets, and our own future on Earth? Venus, the second planet from the sun, is often called Earth's twin. It's similar in size, mass, and composition, but any resemblance ends there. Venus is wrapped in a thick atmosphere made mostly of carbon dioxide with clouds of sulfuric acid. Surface temperatures hover around 465 degrees, 869 degrees hotter than Mercury, even though Mercury is closer to the sun. The atmospheric pressure on Venus is 92 times that of Earth. Standing on Venus is like being 3,000 feet underwater. The sky isn't blue, it's a murky yellow-orange, and the sun is just a blurry glow behind impenetrable clouds. Still, Venus wasn't always like this. Models suggest it might have once had oceans in a temperate climate. Some scientists even believe Venus was the first potentially habitable world in our solar system long before Earth. The Soviet Union's fascination with Venus officially began in 1961 with the launch of Venera 1. It was a bold move. Only four years earlier, they had stunned the world with Sputnik, the first artificial satellite. Now they wanted to reach another planet. Venera 1 lost contact before it could send data. Venera 2 and Venera 3 followed with similar results. In fact, the first five Venera missions all failed. But the sixth attempt, Venera 4, changed everything. Launched yet in 1967, Venera 4 was the first spacecraft to enter another planet's atmosphere and transmit data. It confirmed that Venus's atmosphere was mostly carbon dioxide and much denser than previously thought. It also detected no magnetic field unlike Earth. The Soviet engineers were relentless. They adjusted designs, tested heat shields, and reinforced pressure vessels. In 1970, Venera 7 achieved a milestone, the first successful soft landing on another planet. Though the probe only transmitted for 23 minutes, it was enough. Humanity had landed on Venus. Next came Venera 9 and 10 in 1975. These were the first spacecraft to send back images from the surface of another planet. The images were black and white, but haunting. Jagged rocks under a dark sky, as if the planet itself had been through hell and frozen in time. In 1982, the Soviets launched Venera 13. This was the most advanced Venus lander yet. It survived on the surface for 127 minutes more than two hours in temperatures that would melt most metals. It sent back panoramic images in color. For the first time, we saw the true colors of Venus's surface. Orange-red rocks, a flat, dry terrain. But these images sparked controversy. Dr. Leonid Samfamality of the Russian Academy of Sciences claimed he saw something in the image's objects that seemed to change position between frames. He suggested cautiously that they might be signs of life. Most scientists dismissed the idea. The conditions on Venus are simply too extreme. Yet the speculation lingers. What exactly did the Soviets see? In addition to landers, the Soviets tried something radically different, atmospheric balloons. 
In 1985, the Vega missions deployed balloons that floated high in Venus's atmosphere where temperatures and pressures are more Earth-like. These balloons drifted for days transmitting data on wind speeds, temperature, and atmospheric composition. They helped build the first dynamic profile of Venus's skies. Floating colonies in Venus's upper atmosphere are now a serious area of study. In fact, some researchers argue that we might live in Venus's clouds before we ever set foot on Mars. Why study Venus at all? It's not just scientific curiosity. Venus offers a vision of what could happen to Earth. Billions of years ago, Venus might have had water, but a runaway greenhouse effect turned it into a furnace. Its fate could be a glimpse into Earth's future if we fail to manage our climate. Studying Venus helps us understand atmospheric evolution, planetary geology, and extreme climate shifts. It's a planetary lab one that teaches by example. After the Soviet era ended, Venus exploration slowed, but it didn't stop. ESA's Venus Express orbited the planet from 2006 to 2014. Japan's Ekatsuki is still sending data today. NASA has two upcoming missions, Veritas and Da Vinci Plus. Veritas will map the planet's surface with radar, while Da Vinci Plus will study its atmosphere in detail. Both are set to launch later this decade. There's also Envision from ESA and India's Shukriyan-1 in development. And new private and academic proposals suggest exploring Venus with drones blimps or even cloud cities. One unsung hero of the Venera program was engineer Georgi Babekin. His team was behind the redesigns that made the landers survive Venus's hellish conditions. He died before seeing Venera 7 succeed, but his work laid the foundation. His story reminds us that exploration is never just about machines, it's about people. People who dream, struggle, and build. People who never give up, even when their probes melt or crash. Living on Venus's surface is out of the question for now. But the upper atmosphere around 50, 60 kilometers arm altitude has pressure and temperature similar to Earth. The idea of cloud cities isn't science fiction anymore. NASA's high altitude Venae operational concept, Havoc, proposes airships floating in Venus's sky. These missions could be crewed, with breathable air acting as a lifting gas, floating habitats are surprisingly plausible. So what did the Soviet Union really find on Venus? They didn't find aliens. They didn't find ancient ruins. But they found something perhaps more important, a warning, a mirror, and a mystery. Venus shows us what happens when a planet loses its balance. It warns us of climate catastrophe. It challenges our understanding of habitability. And it beckons us to keep exploring. The Soviets chased Venus not just to prove themselves, but because they believed knowledge, no matter how hard one was worth the risk. And maybe, just maybe, they saw something in those images that made them wonder, are we truly alone 